This is my Putin little uh, carrying case. He's in there. He loves this thing. He's like, he, I, I swear to God, he jumps right in there by himself. I got it open. He's probably going to stay in there. And I don't know. It's like his little house. But anyway, I want to talk about this silver stuff again because it's pretty obvious to me what it means. First off, if the price action was going like this, ebbing and flowing forever, it would never get up there. It needs the hard, fast correction. That's just like 101 trading or whatever, market watching or whatever you want to call it. That's exactly how it happens. Mark Farber says he was kind of hoping for this because shake out, and, you know, shakes out the speculators, speculators, and uh, it just, you know, it's going to cause it to actually go up faster this way overall than if we're sitting here watching uh, 28 to 35 dollars all freaking day, you know. So that's, this is actually a good thing. But next, I'll think of it as electro th electroshock therapy. Basically, what do you need to actually get the market pumping again, the heart pumping? You gotta hit the heart <laughs> and just move it along, right? And this is the this is the case that Putin is in. <laughs> He's, so, the cat is so good, man. He does it. He just follows me around everywhere. But anyway, um, the thing is with the market. Like it's just exactly what they really is needed. What's going on right now? I mean, I don't know what it's going to go down to exactly either. I I suspect that now that everybody's so super bearish and even the bulls are convinced that it's going to go down to like really, really, really bad, it may not because it just seems like anytime too many people think one thing, it does the opposite. It's almost like it's almost like a bubble in reverse. You know, like think of it that way. It's a bubble going down in reverse because silver's not cabbage patch dolls or hoobal hoops. It can't, and the mines aren't even making money at 30 bucks an ounce. Look at the financial statements. Don't look at like the mining cost, the direct mining cost, cost this much and everything. Look at their financial statements. Look, their finan the miners' financial statements look like hell for freaking 2012. And that's at a price of silver like over 30 bucks, a little over 30 bucks for the year. So, <laughs> they're not going to be able to maintain this deal. But the other thing is, let's look back at what happened in 2008. First, the commodities crashed. Then, the markets crashed. And then, what happened? Super duper QE, right? Uh, so, I guess the same thing's going to happen. As far as actual timing, when is all is going to happen? You know, it's like almost easy to conjecture and think to yourself, well, the the commodities crashed, like in, uh, I guess oil, well, I guess gold and silver kind of crashed before the oil, then the oil crashed. But you know the thing is, they haven't got pumped up to a new peak. It's not exactly like 2008. It's in other words, the commodities have already crashed. They've been crashing. The peak was actually here back in 2011. It's not even a perfect comparison, but it's to me that's a pretty decent estimation to say that the markets are going to crash next because hey it's simple 101 you know let's forget about gold for a second you know I know gold is money and all that type of stuff but let's just look at platinum palladium and um, silver you know if the economy is great there would be a lot of price pressure on those metals economy is not great <laughs> so actually what I find very surprising, the reason I could say this is almost like manipulation, because don't even just focus in on a silver price. All the commodities are down. But you know what's down to? The agricultural commodities, like corn and coffee and things. You know, we've had the worst um, drought in the United States since 1936. And even globally, there's been a lot of food production that's been down. And also, we got this major problem that's behind the scenes that the major media doesn't talk about too much, the collapsing of the bee colonies, which is going to affect food production. You know, when you get your nose, like, sticking to your, like, books and your numbers, you know, you kind of forget about these simple things that bees are very necessary to cross-pollination of crops. And droughts, that we even had a drought since as bad as 1936 and it's like oh ho hum you know let's let's go to lunch <laughs> that's a, a typical financial turd you know and uh 
you know, let's go to lunch. You know, what's next? It didn't, you know, maybe lunch. Lunch ain't, you know, they'll worry about it when lunch is in there. <laughs> That's where lunch is, a, you know, 80 bucks or something per person. But, um, you know, that's something else to consider because it's across the board with the commodities. So I, I almost think, you know, if the situation is so rosy, um, well, there should be high production, and which means a big demand on all the commodities across the board. So the stock market basically, it's, it's pretty much, you can, it's a given that it's being pumped up by a lot of buying through the Federal Reserve one way or the other. But that might be the next thing in a crash. That's what happened before. Commodities crashed first, then the markets crashed. There's absolutely no reason they should be that high. But, you know, Mark Farber was saying he was afraid to short. I'm going to point this guy out again. because Actually, Greg Manorino told people to short the stock markets. And, you know, he might be right eventually, but it may take freaking way longer to short the markets than you got funds for. You know, and by the time you win out, you probably lose out so much along the line that it might be a break even or something, you know. So, you know, that's the thing. You got to watch with all this timing stuff. So I always just say stick with your positions. So you got to do it. Stick with your positions because what's going to occur eventually is like this is almost like electroshock therapy. You know, it's maybe not a perfect example, one to one correlation, but that's exactly what's going on. It's like, you know, it's like a shock to the market because, you know, it's going to actually cause money to fly into it. It's going to stimulate investors' interests. And once people, investors get in there and they see it go up, they might, you know, see other investors will be attracted. And then it just kind of takes a life of its own. But on the upside, which is a distance away from now, you should watch what the hell is going to happen because... Actually, me, if I, you know, I'd say, you say silver broke through 50 bucks pretty soon, like within a year or less than a year. Say it was less, say it was in this year. You know, we'd already, we'd already have a gazillion silver bloggers out. We'd have all of them coming out from the woodwork. And actually, I got to point out what, uh, um, it was a kid Dynamite's blog says, yeah, if you pay me, I will actually state anything you want about gold and silver. And actually, I figure that's the deal with some people. You know, they're getting not maybe direct paycheck, but they're getting money somehow for pushing gold and silver. Because we got silver and gold sharks besides to worry about, besides J.P. Morgan sharks and stuff, you know. But... You know, that's why I don't like the game, and I almost can say the same thing what Mark Farber says. It isn't really right to make money on capital gains because you're not doing something for something. But if I feel those gains came from um, worthless eaters who actually don't do too much for people, I don't really care, you know, because I don't have some of the people in the suits and some of the people in the medical establishment I don't like so because they overcharge people for... Uh, you know, cancer cures and that don't work, you know, radiation and chemotherapy. So if I make a bunch of money off of those kind of people, that's no problem with me at all. So, but overall, the only way the middle class is going to get saved is probably through hemp. I keep saying that shit, but you want to really piss off the establishment and the elite. <laughs> Just t keep, t keep telling me, why, why can't hemp be grown? It's not a drug. It's going to solve the oil crisis, the food problem, the, the, the global warming, you know. And that actually would increase middle class wealth across the board. And, you know, they know it. They kind of, you know, once in a while the alternative media brings it up. But I think I'm going to bring it up just about every damn time. Because it's true. That's one thing... And actually, the elite are stupid because if you think like, I gotta I gotta add lib here on the end because, you know, if it was like the elite way back two three thousand years ago, they could not imagine the wealth that the average person has today. But if the elite had to keep their stupid rackets in place for all these thousands of years, like oh, you're only gonna make stones with, you know, other stone chisels, you're not going to use any kind of electricity, you know, if electricity gets discovered, they, they kill them because they're a witch or something, you know, or they're practicing magic, so like, 
you know, they would still have people running, couriers, like writing something on a, uh, you know, parch of paper's leaf or something and say, you know, that's how we send the message. They couldn't imagine what goes on today. You know, they, they couldn't imagine, like, the average person has it way better than the Pharaoh would have had it back a long time ago, basically. So, I mean, it's bad business for them to freaking stifle hemp. Because those jerks will get more toe. You know what I mean? But you can't put it to them like that. They're just stupid. But, you know, that's the one, I think, alternative revolution that you're probably not going to see too much of because... It's actually a real alternative revolution that could benefit everybody. Not just a narrow-minded elite. It'll benefit everybody. The gold stuff, and I think, eventually is going to be a big-time middle-class wealth trap, eventually. Now, how far down is it going to go? Like, I suspected, well, silver is tough to predict. I didn't think it was going to hit 22 originally, so I was saying 24 to 25. That was a Fibonacci point at the way I calculated it. Depends on where you pick that stuff. Um, the uh, gold, it's a lot easier to predict, but as far as it getting down to 1300 1200 like Goldman Sachs is saying, those guys are lying their ass off. <laughs> totally. <laughs> but just like everything they say, you know, the one other thing I ought to point out here, what something else they say, they told most of their investors, most of their investments they recommended for people at the end of 2012 for the future into 2013 was related to the oil industry, around the drilling industry and everything, and it also uh, potash for food and stuff like that. Well, it turns out that oil and gold, it is a fact, they're related. So, I mean, I don't know how they could say, get into all the oil-related industries, yet gold is no good. Because actually, historically, they've been a pretty tight correlation. Now, the one where other outside event that can actually s spook the market into, like, super bull territory really fast and make your head spin, with gold, silver, oil, and everything else that's a commodity, but especially um, gold and oil, would be a war. And this stuff with North Korea, I've been saying it a few times, I think they, I think, they got word that it's very likely that the United States is going to be striking or Israel or something's going to happen with Iran very soon. That's why they're making all this war noise. That's exactly what happened before when they had with Iraq. So if there's a war and all the commodities go this way and that way, well, you know, all the naysayers right now could say it's just cause of the war, but that might be how it's going to play out. So, but yeah, there is manipulation. It's across the board in all the commodities, and you know it's not reflecting true price. Um, the price is not reflecting true supply and demand, especially with something a metal like platinum. Very obvious, you know, very obvious. But it's not reflect, reflecting uh, true price and demand even with food, with all the record, um, you know, droughts they had throughout the world and stuff. So, you know, that's. So in the future, I think we're going to see a pretty fast spike upward, maybe, too, because I can almost consider this almost like a reset where you're talking about it's going to go like an electrical reset, basically, like, you know, somebody putting a thing on a heart and just pumping the metals back up again. But it may not be that fast, but um, I think the next step that's going to come about is the actual stock markets may decline, possibly. They've been talking about that, but maybe it's going to take till the summer, and then you'll see the metals rise in the fall, because Bernanke will have to act very hard regarding the stock markets. So, just think of this almost like a uh, electroshock therapy for the metals markets, because if we were, if things were just going along steady, the, the metals would not go up. They got to hit like a dive like this before to for help them get reset. It's almost like hitting a springboard.